you were the most successful quarterback of all time mm -hmm. at that university. And so you have a, an offensive mind. And so when Fedora left, who was your offensive coordinator, mm -hmm. you actually did the offensive coordination sure. mm -hmm. a little bit, right? And that occupies a lot of space. Only, you only have so much. I only have so much. And so what I found in those two years, we were successful. We were, we were, we were really good on offense, and we won a lot of football games. But what I found is that I was short with my team in understanding the defense, their personalities, them seeing me in practice, because I had to spend time with the offense and coaching quarterbacks and, and get them ready. So the defense is separate, so I wasn't spending quality time with them. They weren't seeing my face, and I didn't know enough about the game. There were times during the game when I had to leave the sideline and go back to the bench area and work with the quarterback and talk about plays and get my play calling chart prepared for the next drive. I didn't have a clue what was going on in the game. Now, I trusted the defensive staff, but there's still times when I needed to know what was going on for a decision to be made, and that wasn't happening. And I felt like that, that I wasn't a very good recruiter as a head coach because I just didn't have the time and the man hours weren't available. And, and that sends signals maybe that you care more about offense than you do defense, which exactly isn't accurate, right. Sure. right? That's right. And so you sort of evolved back into that coach, and now, um, we were talking about this and you said, now what my job is, I, I think and I observe. It's funny, my 11 year old, um, I'll come home and, and, and both of them are active sports, we've talked about that. And so we'll hit ground balls and I'll throw in batting practice or whatever season it is, shoot baskets, whatever. And when I come in at 8.45 or nine o'clock, the 11 year old will come down and he'll say, well, let's go do this or this. And I'll say, you know, I just need to, I need to be able to eat something and just chill for a second, you know, and he'll go, well, what have you been doing? And I said, <laughs> I've, I, I said, I've been at work all day. He says, you sit at a desk, and da Danielle is my assistant, and he says, you're always ten telling Danielle to look something up on a computer or get you information. Why are you tired? You don't do anything. <laughs> That's exactly what he tells me, and I said, well, I think a lot, and he said, well, I think too. <laughs> And I joked with him. I said, I saw one of your report cards. You obviously don't think a lot of it, <laughs> which, which he, he does good in school. But anyway, you and I were talking, and, and when you do this long enough, and I've been fortunate to, to be at Oklahoma State a long time, other than five years of, uh, since 1986, I've been there as a player or a coach or an assistant coach, you, you get a, a better feel and so it's as, in my opinion, it's as important for me to think and make good decisions with the uh, support staff of 70 people and the 130 players than it is for me to draw up a successful offensive play. Yeah, and you said a lot of guys can draw up the play. There's a lot of football coaches that can draw up good plays. Um, and I, I heard an example one time, Scott Verplank, who's a professional golfer, is an Oklahoma State alum, loves Oklahoma State football, and he's around all the time. And he gave me an example of, he said, there's a lot of guys that can hit a golf ball a long ways and get up on, on the green and knock it in in one or two shots and score good. But he said, there's not very many of them that can hit a bad shot, recover and do it again. And he said, that's the difference between the PGA Tour and all the guys that can shoot 65 at their local course, but they can't do it when it counts. Well, it's, it's kind of the same principle in coaching. And, um, once, once you realize that, it makes, makes us much better at our job, in my opinion. And, and you were talking, you said you became a better coach when you didn't care if you got fired. No question. The human nature, um, when you get a job and, and you're young and you're hungry and you're out there, um, you know, it's, it's, it's your paycheck, it's your survival, you have young children. And um, in our profession, to stay in one place for an extended period of time, which would be more than three or four years, is... Um, somewhat unique. So it's always in the back of your mind whether you're going to move your children, they're going to be in different schools all the time. And once we had um, a couple good years, because when they, when they hired me as a head coach, I don't know if I would have hired me as a head coach. I was young, I was 38 years old, um, obviously didn't have any experience, and uh, I was probably on a two or three year trial. Um, we had enough success that, that I was able to get a second contract. And what that did is that gave me some stability and also 
um, allowed me to, to relax a little bit more. Um, and what happened was uh, I started to make better decisions in actually what is driving winning more so than um, worried about what somebody thinks about decisions we make and, and what happens on Saturdays in games. And I've talked to a number of coaches in all sports, and it's pretty – it's a pretty high percentage, and they'll say the same thing, is when you quit worrying about winning the games and what people think and worrying more about the success in, in these young men, young women winning off the field and on the field, you become a better coach. Well, and it's interesting because the creativity you have is probably one of your best strengths. Mm -hmm. And you look at uh, the Alabama recruiting uh, expenses. Mm -hmm. What's their... Well, Alabama is it was uh, close to two million, uh, give or take, depending on what publication you look at. And and in that same year, which was a year ago, we were at two hundred and ninety six thousand. And and yet the expectation mm -hmm. is for you to win at a very very high level. Sure. And so you have to think creatively. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you came up with, this is outstanding, um, is the satellite camps. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? Twelve years ago, um, we, we sat in a room and we, we were just started our, with our, my first staff and we talked about some of the things that we, we visited about is, um, okay, we have a losing record here as a school. Um, we're in a state where Oklahoma's had a lot of success in football. We're in a conference where we have not won a conference championship ever. And so these things we have to accomplish, what are we going to do? How's it going to happen? And so um, there's four million people in the state of Oklahoma, and give or take, there'll be five, six, seven players in state. This year's a really good year, but in the past, that um, Oklahoma State and Oklahoma would offer a scholarship. Well, you have a roster of 130, and you have 85 on scholarship. So if you look at those numbers, you're going to have to go elsewhere to find players. Well, Texas is obviously a very populated state, and, and on average they have about 350 Division I football players a year. And the, the North Texas, uh, Dallas Metroplex area is four hours, give or take, where you are to um, Stillwater. So it's really in-state for us. So we said we, we have to do a great job of recruiting there. Then how do we get out there and market Oklahoma State, Oklahoma State football, so they can get to know you guys and us. So we said, let's, let's take our camp on the road. So we- And you're uh, like the first guy to, to do I it. I think we were the first. Um, I don't know if anybody's actually verified that, but I, I think we were, I don't know if anybody else was doing it at that time, going out of state with a, for a camp. So we got in a, in a big bus, you know, we were on like, like a minor league baseball team. Everybody was on there. We had camps set up. We had two in Dallas, two in Houston, one in Central Texas, one in San Antonio, and one in East Texas, prime uh, recruiting areas for us. So we could get out. We could have a four-hour camp. We could teach and instruct the young people. They would get to know us. Um, hey, I like that coach. I want to now, now I want to drive up and look and see what's at Oklahoma State. And we started that. Um, we did it for six or seven years, and then the uh, um, different uh, organizations implemented a policy where you couldn't leave your state and do it. So then we uh, paired up with Mary Harden Baylor, who's in the state of Texas. They own the camps. Our coaches work for them, and we've continued on with them, and, and we did it up until, to, you know, hey, it is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is. I mean, and, um, and, and so. Well, now talk about this. Well, and then. As of last year, they've become very popular because um, most all your big schools are doing it now. And so they followed suit and other schools started in on it. And what happened is it became watered down and saturated. So we then had a meeting uh, a year ago and we said uh, these, these camps were, were great for Oklahoma State, but now so many schools are doing them, what can we do to get an edge? Uh, to keep it going. And so we came up with what I called the Walmart theory, uh, which is a mega camp where you can go into Walmart and you plan on buying two things and who goes into Walmart to buy two things and comes out with less than 30 things? Nobody. So you get everything you need. So we said, okay, um, you can't recruit at these camps. And, and we really don't because uh, 
in, in this year, the NCAA traveled with us and they did a lot of the camps, which is good because you want them to be there. So we said, let's get all the other schools that want to be with us. We'll call it a mega camp so a young man can pay, I think it was $30. He comes to a four hour camp and there's 25 schools there. So um, it worked for us. We had, uh, we had our five camps in the state of Texas this year and we had over 2,000 juniors, rising juniors and rising seniors. Wow over 2,000, and it's great for us and it's great for the student athletes. Um, so uh, we're gonna try to grow it even more next year, but it, it was a way for us to um, overcome not having uh, population like some of the, your major schools that we have to compete against. Uh, well, maybe you can tell that to your son when he asks why you Yeah, that's what else we were doing, <laughs> sure, right. that's right. Uh, so, well, and I think that the best thing that you've been able to do uh, based on the conversations is identify who you want to bring in because it mm -hmm. takes a special kid to want to come and play in Stillwater. That's right. And, and you take two stars, sometimes three, you know, and, and you convert them. And, and the, what we've said with that is, is we're going to take some two stars and when they leave, they're going to be a three star. We're going to take threes and they're going to be a four. And if, if, we're, if we get the fours, we're going to turn them into fives. And the, the fives that we get, we've only gotten one five-star guy since I've been there. And so um, I have to trust, we have to trust that the organization, the uh, setup that we have, academics, strength conditioning, our coaches, the way we develop young people, um, the way we take care of their bodies, we, we're, we have all the science and keeping them fresh, that we have to make them better in order for us to compete at a high level. And that's how fortunate we are that I've been there 12 years that we have that set up and the system pretty much runs itself. And, and you have a lot of evidence of that success. And, and part of that evidence is Rob Glass. Sure. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take about a five minute break here and then we're gonna bring Rob out and then we're gonna talk about the character development system that they're implementing at Oklahoma State. Thanks a lot, Mike. All right.